channel open. Welcome back to Weekly Trek, a proud member of the Tricorder Transmissions podcast network and presented in partnership with TrekCore.com. I am your host, Alex Perry. What's today's date? The date. Today's show was recorded on June 8th, 2022, and is current through the Star Trek Strange New Worlds episode, Spock Amok, so beware of spoilers. I've got to say that two episodes in a row now, which is great. Spock Amok. And if you are in one of the regions where any of the Star Trek shows have not yet aired and you are trying to stay spoiler free, be sure to check the episode article on Trek Core for time codes for each of our stories tonight in order to avoid them. All right, let's get into the show. Good day, Voyager, and welcome to A Briefing with Neelix. It's a catchy title, isn't it? Weekly Trek is a regular news show covering the biggest stories from the Star Trek franchise. We are in a new golden age of Star Trek. There are five television shows in production, possibly more on the way, and enough merchandise to fill the Bajoran wormhole. So stick with me and I'll help you sort the real facts from lots of the Dominion propaganda that you'll find online. But I can't do this alone. And my guest this week is returning guest and co-host of the Infinite Diversity podcast. It's Thad Hate. Thad, welcome back to Weekly Trek. I'm always happy to be here. All right, Thad. Well, you know the drill by now. I want to know something that's got you excited about Star Trek at the moment. What's got you moving at Warp 10? So there's actually like three things that are all, right, all excited on me. at the moment. I mean... Obviously, Strange New Worlds, but at this point, that's a given. <laughs> sure. The big thing is next month is Shore Leave, the convention in Hunt Valley, Maryland. Yep. Uh, this will be the first time they've had it since 2019. Yep. And I'm very excited for that. I'm going to see a bunch of friends, going to get to hang out with Star Trek book authors. It's going to be a blast. Yep, I will see you there. All right. The other one is those Playmates action figures. So some photos came out from a convention. I think it was in... The UK? Yes, London Film and Comic Con. Yes, of what the new Playmates action figures look like. And they look great. And I wasn't expect. I knew they had described the TNG figures as being in nostalgic packaging. Yeah. I hadn't actually expected to get hit with literal nostalgia when seeing them, but they look <laughs> amazing. They look just uh-huh. like the figures from the 90s. Yeah. And you know me, I'm a very anti keeping things in the packaging. Sure. But I'm going to have to buy a second set of those just to keep them in the package. <laughs> yes. When you showed me that picture, I bought myself a second set <laughs> to keep them in the packaging uh yeah it, it a few things one yes nostalgic packaging for the win the discovery figures which are in the new star trek universe packaging is obviously much more modern and you know mm-hmm. they've got a they've got a sort of a proper one for that but yeah for the tng figures and for the for the ratha khan figures they are going all the way back to the card backs that they had in the early 90s oh i hadn't even seen a photo of what the ratha khan ones look like oh yeah 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 i think the one i saw was not it was not a like a, a like an actual shot it was like a concept shot that was that was floating around do they use the classic star trek card back that they used for those in the 90s or something else they used the the like red one that they did the movie era characters on so right. like okay. chang and sabic and right and yeah. yeah and they yeah. used they they did it on the brand of classic star trek yes yes okay. yes that's yes. cool yeah so the same uh, it, one it would also be cool to do them in the the later waves where they, it's just like the light blue star trek logo those yeah. are cool too yep yeah. Oh, yeah. Those were that was very classy. And I will say the other thing too. Also, seeing obviously, really, the only thing that we have seen to date of the Playmates figures is the sort of promotional shot mm-hmm. that is with all of the retail listings. That shoe is really and and there's always a difference between what that looks like and what's actually in the packaging. Mm-hmm. And and sometimes that's for the better and sometimes that's for the worse. For action <laughs> figures, it's, it's, it's a bit hit and miss which way it goes, right? Are the prototypes that they photograph better or is the thing in the package better? And actually looking at them in the packaging, I actually think I like them a little bit more than I do in the retail listings. I still don't completely love the Riker face sculpt. Yeah. I mean, I'm still getting it, obviously, but I think the sculpt of the 90s one looked a little little better oh no i 100 agree with you on that i think the 90s sculpts for picard for data and for Riker are all superior than the 2022 sculpts but i like them more than the one that i saw that right. you know than the Same. one that's on the retail listing and you know the other thing that like just had me like almost squealing with glee is that the, the tng ones are coming with 
the type two phaser with an attached orange <laughs> beam, which yes. is the dumbest thing. I thought it was yes. dumb when I was a kid. Yes, I, I cut, cut a bunch off. of them yeah. off. <laughs> but because I had them as a kid and that's how they came when I was a kid, it is very exciting to see that again. <laughs> All right, let me tell you what I'm feeling good about Star Trek this week. And it's the Strange New Worlds cast's enthusiasm for Star Trek. Now, every cast is enthusiastic about Star Trek, right? The Discovery cast led the way with being really enthusiastic about Star Trek. The Lower Decks cast, obviously, hugely enthusiastic about Star Trek. The Picard cast, I've never... Never sort of gotten them outside of Michelle Hood and Issa Brion as an Ever Never Gora, right? Like, got a huge sense that they're particularly thrilled about being in Star Trek, but set that one aside. <laughs> the Stranger Worlds cast seem like, and they are having just an absolutely fabulous time with being the Stranger Worlds cast, right? Yes. Even the actors in that cast who are not like big, they were not pre existing Star Trek fans, right? Christina Chong, for example, mm -hmm. Jess Bush, they've talked about how, you know, they got the part. They'd not really watched any Star Trek before, though. But by virtue of having the part, they've obviously become much bigger fans in the process. And it's just so fun to see that and to see how much fun they're having and how much they're enjoying interacting with the fans and with the material and how much even in what was clearly a very challenging time to be making television, they seem like they had a pretty good time doing Strange New Worlds. And so it's just been an absolute delight to kind of follow, you know, people like Melissa Navia on Twitter, who plays Erica Ortegas, who just seems like she's having an absolute blast with it. And so it's just been very fun. And because they're having fun, I'm having fun, and it helps that the show's excellent. And so, yeah, I think for me, that just, I was just seeing a lot of that this week with our news stories and anytime. Uh, an actor on one of these shows gets interviewed, they get asked, you know, are, are you liking it? Are you having a good time? And some of the answers feel pretty perfunctory, but I always get the sense with the Stranger Worlds cast that like, no, they actually mean it. They're having a great time. Yes, I agree. They are very just their enthusiasm enthusiasm is contagious. Yeah. I also really like how Melissa Navia will just immediately destroy any troll that says anything bad to it. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of fun to watch. It's very uh, Wilson Cruz-esque. Yes. <laughs> I, I don't know if you saw, there were, I think it was uh, Celia Rose Gooding posted some photos of some of the cast just hanging out in downtown Toronto. And yeah. I just love that. They just, yeah. they, they all looked like they were just really enjoying each other's company and loving being there. Yeah, it was it was really fun to see. And, it, and I think, you know, they did not get a chance to like hang out with each other a lot during season one because of all the COVID protocols. So it must mm -hmm. be nice to finally get the chance to spend some time with your castmates. Yeah. All right. Well, with that, let's turn to the week's top stories. There's a war going on and I'm a reporter. Well, as we were just talking about, Star Trek fans are loving the first season of Star Trek Strange New Worlds. And over the last two episodes, as of the time of this recording, we've seen up through episode five, that's Spock Amok, have been quite a study in contrasts. The thriller Memento Mori, followed by the comedy Spock Amok, are among the two best episodes of the season to date, in my opinion. And after covering Memento Mori two weeks ago, it's now Spock Amok's turn. First up is Spock actor Ethan Peck, who told Sci-Fi Wire that the opening fight scene between a fully Vulcan and a fully human Spock caused Peck to explore the character in new ways. That was really difficult for me because up until that point, I had been playing a more Vulcan Spock or, you know, just Vulcan period, he said. And so to let go of all those inhibitions that I carry around as that character and that performance felt very counterintuitive. I think it was more about becoming aware of them and letting them go, he continued. Sometimes the acting process can be so difficult to articulate because it's just something intuitive. It's something you feel. And furthermore, I worried how much is Ethan in this human? Perhaps all of it, right? And I'm still getting to know myself. So it's very like weird strange self-centered process and in discussing what it was like to play to pring pretending to be spot peck talked about his preparation with to pring co-star gia santu quote we spent a lot of time together re reading each other's lines for each other and just paying very close attention to our mannerisms and the way we use our voices he explained because at some point i'm ethan playing spock in the spirit of to pring pretending to be spock <laughs> and so it got very complicated and convoluted at certain points and it's just something i did with as much care as possible and as much focus as possible fad what was your opinion of Ethan Peck's performance in Spock Amok. I loved it. I think Ethan, I mean, I think he's been doing a great job since the beginning, but especially now in these last couple episodes of Strange New Worlds, he is 
really coming into his own in the role. Agreed. Yeah, he's, I think he really is starting to own the Spock character very much, mm-hmm. you know, and, and and sort of make it his own in a way where it's like, okay, now you could see Ethan Peck playing Spock for the next decade type thing, right? Like, this isn't just a drop-in from some actor who is doing their best not to screw up the legacy of Leonard <laughs> Nimoy, right? Who knows they're just going to be doing it for a certain amount of time. And I'm not calling out any specific actor for doing this, right? Like, sure. you know, that's not a Zachary Quinto knock. That's just a, you could see any actor coming in and playing this role. And I think maybe Ethan Peck, when he first started playing the role on Discovery, probably came in and thought, well, as long as I just don't screw this up for however long it, it, you know, this thing lasts for, it'll be fine. But now, of course, he really has to focus on making this role his own. And I think we really are starting to see Ethan Peck's version of Spock very much starting to shine through. It still very much channels the Leonard Nimoy performance, but it is very authentically, to me anyway, feels like an earlier version of, of, of Leonard Nimoy's Spock. And I think Ethan's confidence with the role has really increased significantly as well to the point Point that you really now have that kind of finely balanced spockiness, I guess, between, you know, the sort of cold and emotionless Spock and the Spock that's actually quite funny, right? Like that started to come through a lot in mm-hmm. this episode, um, which I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really, really enjoying. I loved when he teased Chapel and said that humans are almost as easy to tease as Vulcans. That was just fantastic. Yeah. And he plays an excellent to bring. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. And I, <laughs> when they said, no doubt, now that you are aware, you can tell the difference from our mannerisms to Pike. And Pike <laughs> yeah. is like, yeah. No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, it, it's great. I think uh, at this point, Ethan Peck has solidly surpassed Zachary Quinto, in my opinion, as, yes. as my second favorite Spock. This is in no way a uh, detriment to Ethan, but I don't think he can ever surpass Leonard Nimoy just nobody can right like it, it's Leonard's role it will always be Leonard's role he played that role for 50 years it's right. never gonna you know he will always be the number one Spock but Ethan can be a very solid 1.5 yes. Spock <laughs> absolutely yeah and, and I you know I I like I like that idea of them doing rehearsals where it's like all right you read the liners to Pring and then I'll do my best to kind of you know mimic that performance to sort of capture the essence of Gia Sandhu's performance in Ethan Peck's performance as to Pring, pretending to be Spark. It's just all, it's just all, Is I loved this episode. I thought it was so wonderfully, it's my favorite episode of the season so far. You know, one, because it's like low stakes Star Trek and, and I love low stakes Star Trek, especially low stakes Absolutely. live action Star Trek, which we've not had, you know, really very much of at all in this kind of new era of Star Trek. And it was just really fun, right? It was, a body swap episode and it was done so well because it entirely relied on Ethan Peck doing a great job of sort of mimicking Gia Sandhu's performance and Gia Sandhu doing an incredible job of mimicking Ethan Peck's performance as Spark and sort of being able to switch back between the two of them. It wouldn't have worked if they weren't such capable actors, I don't think. Yes, and I think it just was... Amazing. For all the same reasons that you just said. I mean, I uh, could talk about how much I loved Spock Amok for an hour. In fact, I did, if you want to listen to Infinite Diversity. (laughs) But yeah, it's just fantastic. They did an incredible job together, and I really couldn't speak more highly of it. Well, in addition to Ethan Peck telling the Spock side of the story, his co-star Gia Sandhu, who plays Dupring, spoke to The Hollywood Reporter about both Spock and Mark and playing the iconic original series character. In discussing her preparation to play Dupring, Sandhu said, quote, I went right to the source and watched a mock time, which I'd never seen before. I'd actually never seen any of the original series, so that happened to be the first episode I ever saw. I remember watching Arlene Martell and going, oh my goodness, I'm playing her? I was so excited. Although her role is brief on screen, it's very impactful. Tapring is only in a mock time, so it took a lot of pressure off what I think the other actors have to face. Arlene created this beautiful outline of a character, but there was definitely a lot of room for me to still color within that outline. I looked at Ethan's material from Star Trek Discovery and also went back to Leonard Nimoy's performances. There were a lot more components to think about when you're playing somebody who's more established versus playing somebody who's less established. You get to really use your own imagination and your own creativity to get you there. Sandhu also talked 
talked about her interpretation of the T'Pring character. She said, I think T'Pring specifically carries herself with a lot of grace and she's very deliberate in how she speaks. Her words are chosen very carefully and this all comes from Arlene Martel, the original T'Pring. I definitely wanted to retain as much of that kind of elegance as I could. I think underneath, she's probably a bit nervous too. She and Spock are two people who love each other and are trying to navigate the ultimate long distance relationship living on two different planets. Both of their intentions are certainly to make sure this relationship succeeds. And asked about the inevitable end to the Spock to Pring relationship that we have already seen. Sandhu said, you do have to let go of the future and try to honor what's written for us right now. It is a very relatable situation. In any relationships, there are disappointments and there are triumphs. And the other part that I kind of love about this is that there is a bit of a love triangle that's evolving at the same time. So I think there's a juiciness there as far as Nurse Chapel brings to the situation. There's just challenge after challenge that they're having to meet and work through. And I think that's definitely what makes it super relatable. Thad, We've talked a little bit about Gia Sandhu's performance so far as T'Pring in Strange New Worlds, but like, what do you think about this interpretation of the T'Pring character? I love it. Uh, she's taken a character that we really didn't know too much about. All we knew was that she wanted Spock to fight to the death rather than marry him and given us a lot more nuance. Let us help us see how that character gets to that point. And because you can already see that the groundwork is being laid for that because it's clear that she believes Spock is too tied to his duty and that's just going to continue. And I love how well they work together. Like you want them to end up together, even though you yeah. know yeah. they can't. Yeah, it's really fascinating, I think, in the layers that it adds to a mock time, mm -hmm. right? Like the assumption in a mock time, which is not explicitly said out loud in the episode, but is very, very heavily implied. And they have sort of taken that sliver of room and have kind of, you know, blown out a giant hole in the side of it. The implication is that Spock and T'Pring were matched when they were children, and this is the first time they're seeing each other since that point in time. And obviously, A Mock Time is one of the best episodes of Star Trek The Original Series. It's one of the best episodes in the Star Trek franchise, period. But there is that element there around the emotional resonance of it does not go as far as it could if, as we're seeing in Strange New Worlds, there actually was an adult relationship between Spock and T'Pring, right? They tried to make it work and for whatever reason it fell apart and somebody broke somebody's heart and this was the sort of very, very messy end to the relationship. So messy that it resulted in a fight to the death. That is so much more powerful, I think, than just these are two people who were thrown together, never really got along with each other and are just looking for a way out of this. Because now either... You know, and I think the other thing too is in a mock time, it's very easy to side with Spock, right? It's very easy to look at T'Pring and go, oh, well, she is, you know, being selfish or, you know, does not have good motives here and sort of lay all the blame for this situation at her doorstep and say, well, Spock is innocent here. But now if they're trying to, which they're clearly leading towards something much deeper and more complicated than that, right? It, it really heightens that tragedy factor of mock time and it makes a mock time a better episode in the process. Sort of very similar, I think, in some ways to what they're doing in the Switching franchise right now, the Obi-Wan Kenobi series over on Disney Plus around creating more of a history between Obi-Wan and Anakin Skywalker in the intervening period between Revenge of the Sith and A New Hope to kind of sharpen those moments in New Hope without sort of entirely contradicting what happened there. Yes, I think that's, you, you hit the nail on the head. It's fascinating and that's how we're going to get a lot of stories here in this prequel of Strange New Worlds is we're going to flesh out a lot of things that we only know a little bit about. And I say more power to them. Keep at it because they're doing an amazing job of it. Yeah, totally, totally. Where do you, like, do, I guess, do you think to bring is a season one story that then sort of stops and doesn't go any further? Do you think that, that the to bring relationships going to last multiple seasons? What's your sense of it right now? I think it'll go longer than one season. Whether it'll go the whole length of the show, I don't know. We still don't know how many seasons the show's going to have. Yeah. But I think it will go throughout the show. I think we'll start to see the relationship sour as the show progresses. Yeah. Yeah. I guess it's, it, it, it's, it's an open question for me. Like how much material do they think they have here 
to play this relationship out. Clearly a lot more, right? It's a Star mm-hmm. Trek show and there's lots they can potentially do with it. But I, I, my guess is maybe by the end of season two, the T'Pring story is sort of wrapped up, which would, you know, be a decent amount of time, I think. Yeah. Well, high-end collectibles company Tomy have launched a crowdfunding campaign to raise $3 million to be able to manufacture a series of models of the original series USS Enterprise. Costing $600 each, the ship will measure 34 inches long and weigh almost 20 pounds. It's going to be a heavy ball. So this is a hefty model, which was developed in partnership with Enterprise expert Gary Kerr to replicate the original series filming model in exacting detail and is based on the USS Enterprise filming model as seen in the Smithsonian today, which after a number of failed restorations for the 50th anniversary was lovingly restored to its mid-1960s origins. Tomy are seeking approximately 5,000 people to ensure that the creation of this model is economically viable. It's one of those crowdfunding campaigns where... If they hit the 3 million, they all get made. If they don't hit the 3 million, zero get made. So as of the time of recording, I think it's been up for about 24, 36 hours, something like that. They're about 10% of the way towards their crowdfunding goal. Be interesting to see if in the 30-day period that there is available for the crowdfunder, if they can ultimately get those 5,000 people. I know everybody already has a few different versions of the TOS Enterprise in their collections. I spent a while looking at this one and honestly, like... This one looks really cool to me. I spent some up close and personal time with the, not that up close and personal, with the uh, filming model uh, at the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum before they put it in a box because they were doing all the big renovations at that museum. And this one looks like exactly like what I saw in the case at the Smithsonian. Whether it's worth the price or not, right? $600 is a lot of money, is going to be up to each individual fan to figure out is this something I really want? Is this something that I have the the resources to be able to afford? I mean, that's definitely on the higher end of high-end collectibles. Thad, I knew you're a big ship guy. Think you're going to pick this one up? <laughs> I am a big ship guy. It does look amazing. Uh, it's a bit too rich for my blood. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I I think I am in the same boat about it. If it was the Enterprise D, I'd very strongly consider it. I was thinking about that. If they did the D or the Defiant, then I'm going to have to think really long and hard. Yeah. But... I I just can't afford six hundred dollars. I mean, I can't afford six hundred dollars regardless of what ship it is. But I might be willing to, you know, not afford it and still buy it if it were a different ship. Right, and especially given, I mean, the TOS Enterprise is the most replicated <laughs> ship model in existence, right? At all price points. I think I can see three of them in my house right now. <laughs> yeah, right. You've got the Playmates one on the way. You've got the Eagle Moss ones, the small one, and the XL. And the Discovery version. There's so many versions. I've got of... the Mega Blocks one. Yep, the Mega Blocks one. I guess there's also the Hot Wheels, the Johnny Lightning, the original, original Playmates from the 90s. There have been a bunch of the different uh, Hallmark ones. Yep, a bunch of the different Hallmark ones, a bunch of the different Art Asylum slash Diamond Select ones, right? They probably did four or five versions of the TOS Enterprise hey, to sort of reflect of all orange. the different modifications. And yes, one of them. Well, the, that was the motion picture one. And the You're less right. we talked about that, the better, because <laughs> that was a dreadful toy. So yeah, but it's really, like, it is really cool. I mean, if $600 was the equivalent of like $100 for me, in terms of if I was rich enough that that... <laughs> I thought that like a $600 investment was what I think today a $100 investment is. I'd probably do it, but I don't think I'm there. I don't think I'm there. Again, if it were the Enterprise D, I'd probably spring for it. I'd really like like a, and this thing's big, right? 34 inches long. I mean, that's three feet. That's basically as long as the desk that I'm sitting at is like three feet long. And I don't know where I would put that, right? (laughs) What I find ridiculous is they don't have any bulk pricing. They offer, you can buy one, two, or three, but yeah. the two is is $1,198, which is two times five ninety nine, and the, <laughs> and the three is $1,797. you are uh-huh. not even going to knock like five bucks off if you're going to buy three of them. I guess they're trying to stop people from, from reselling, right? I guess, but if this is a limited run, like yeah. that's right. going to happen anyway, 5, 000, and the price right. is going to go way up for the reselling too. Yes, yeah. So yeah. that is the thing. If yeah. you can afford the 1800 investment, dollar investment buy the three of them keep one and flip the others and make your money back yeah true i can't afford the 1800 dollar investment <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> i want to pay rent this month <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so yeah i think it's it's very very cool i hope that it's successful because i always hope that every star trek 
merchandising thing is successful because the more that are successful the more they'll be the more that are unsuccessful the less they'll be you know right Tommy does this and they're successful they'll do another one they do this and they're not successful guaranteed they're not going to do another one so and maybe the next one would be something that i'm interested in so i'll say if you're a huge fan of the tos enterprise and you've been looking for maybe the definitive version right this thing's got leds in it it lights up from the inside you the, can you know, see inside the shuttle bay yeah it's it's really really nice i am i talking myself into this right now no i'm not talking <laughs> yes, myself you are. i'm not talking myself into this you right should now. buy it you so be quiet I can come over to your house and look at it because because we're about to talk about XO6 figures, and I have bought all of those. So we're not doing the Tommy And Enterprise. I also want to come over to your house and look at those. <laughs> but somebody else should buy the Tommy Enterprise and let me come over to their house and look at it. Yeah, okay. and me. Yes, me and Thad. We're coming over and we're going to take selfies with it. Okay. <laughs> and lastly this week, one six scale action figure company, XO6, are on a bit of a tear with three new pre-releases available to buy by the time you listen to this episode. The latest additions to the collection join the already released 1-6 scale Star Trek First Contact Picard, Star Trek First Contact Data, Star Trek Voyager Captain Janeway, Star Trek Voyager The Doctor, Star Trek Mirror Spark. Those are the ones that have been released right now. Also the ones whose pre-orders have concluded and we're waiting for delivery for, Star Trek The Next Generation Judge Q, the Enterprise E Command Chair. Those ones are done. If you've got one, you got one. If you didn't, you can find them on some of the retail sites like Big Bad Toy Store and Entertainment Earth. They have availability for you to order those. But in terms of what's currently available for pre-order on the XO6 website right now, actually quite a lot. Captain <laughs> Cisco is still available for pre-order, available in either standard or essentials format, which is this new thing they've done for the Cisco figure. The primary difference is in the accessories. The standard edition will have more accessories and costume pieces than the essentials so for cisco that means i think if i'm remembering correctly there's a phaser rifle with the standard version which is does not come with the essentials version correct also the whiskey glass is only with this with the standard version yes the inner pale moonlight water glass is only available in the standard version and on the costume if you get the standard version you have the ability to do the vest look from in the pale moonlight or the standard duty uniform look with the essentials version you don't get the vest you've only got the standard jacket in order to do it. and it's a little cheaper it's like 15 to 20 bucks cheaper for the essentials yeah i think version. it was 20 dollars cheaper yeah so mirror uh hikaru sulu is next and actually honestly provides the absolute best George Takei likeness of any product I have ever seen that wasn't a picture of George Takei. QMX released a 1-6 Sulu figure a couple of years ago, which I re- reviewed for TrekCore, and uh, that was described as looking like Asian Jimmy Fallon. The, the likeness to George Takei <laughs> in that one uh, was not so great, but X06 have absolutely nailed to the wall, George Takei's likeness and sort of evil sly grin from the episode Mirror Mirror. And so if you purchase the also incredible rendition of Leonard Nimoy in the Mirror Spock figure, I think Sulu is going to pair extremely, extremely well with him. The Voyager crew are also getting an expansion with the addition of Mr. Tuvok. Tuvok is the third Voyager crew member released in the line. As I said, the previously released Janeway and the Doctor, we also know Seven of Nine is on the way. And XO6 have indicated that they may be in a position to actually complete out the Voyager main cast members by the end of of next year. As I say, we've seen prototype images for Seven of Nine. They're trying to do the absolute best job they possibly can on the Voyager 7 of 9, knowing it's going to be extremely popular amongst our Star Trek fanboys. So yeah, Tuvok joins the line. And on Thursday, June 9th, which is tomorrow from when we're recording this, but is in the past from when you're listening to this, X06 have now made available for pre-order Michael Burnham from Star Trek Discovery. The Discovery Star is being released in the Season 2 uniform. Sorry, Captain Burnham fans, but X06 says they are very strongly considering doing a Captain Burnham later down the line. X06 owner Nanjin has also said that the Discovery line and the other figures based upon the newest shows of the Star Trek franchise will release separately from the main figure line and will not impact release plans for legacy characters. So if you're not a huge Discovery fan and you see a Burnham figure come out, don't worry, it did not delay your Wrath of Khan, Kirk and Spark, and your motion picture Kirk and Spark has nothing to do there and on separate release timelines, it's nothing t- connected to doing those legacy characters. Thad, if I recall correctly, you've maybe got one or two of these figures 
any of yep. the ones we just talked about catch your eye? So I have the Janeway figure, which is yep. fantastic. And I have pre-ordered the Cisco. All right. Uh, which one's ironically you go with? enough, I ordered the Essentials version that is not the Cisco that can live with it, but I can live with the fact that it's the Essentials version. <laughs> the problem with these figures, and they're fantastic. Uh, well, some of them, the sculpts weren't the greatest. Like the Doctor, I didn't care for that face yep. sculpt. But most of them have been fantastic. But they're $200. Yes. So... <laughs> It's Playmates figures, these so are not. These. Yes. <laughs> um, so I, the Sulu one looks cool, but if I were to buy that, then I would also want Mirror Spock, and yep. then I would want all the other Mirror figures when they come out. So that's, sure. no. Yep. The Tuvok looks amazing. And I do kind of want him to go with my Janeway, yeah. but I think I'm going to hold off. What a great, what a great character pairing though. I mean, if you're going to do true. a character pairing, for me, that's the one you're going to do for Voyager. Oh, yeah. And that Michael Burnham is probably the one that tends to be the most. Yeah. Because I think that likeness is really good, too. Yeah. Uh, if it were Captain Burnham, I might have had to pull the trigger already. And that said, I think the odds of them doing a Captain Burnham figure down the line, assuming that all these figures continue to sell well, I think are pretty good. Yes. Because you and I were both at Mission Chicago where X06 yep. was. And they had like a what I can only describe as a metric ton of figure prototypes available, like on on display there they are making so many different figures in coming up yeah and i really hope they do all continue to sell well because i i do wonder how many people are other than you are willing to spend 200 dollars <laughs> for each one of these figures yeah but i hope they do continue to sell well and they keep making them so that i can buy all of my favorites i know coming up i definitely want the jonathan archer figure because that looks oh, right sure. amazing yeah and i'm gonna have to get the Riker figure as well yep. yeah yeah <laughs> yeah as you as you have indicated i have i i have ordered all of them <laughs> um uh the burden figure goes up tomorrow and it's the first one where i'm like well no I, the, originally the sulu was the one i was like all right this is the first I was one say, I don't yeah buy. you definitely did say you weren't going to order the sulu yeah, and, then and i did and i did the <laughs> and the reason for that is because i kind of only want and I'm, I'll break this for Spock because I got the mirror Spock because I thought it just looked so good. I kind of only want one version of each character. Right. There are a couple I would consider getting multiples for Picard. They're going to make like the 10 contact. different Spocks based yeah. on those prototypes. Yeah, it's right. ridiculous. Yeah, like I, I, don't, I don't think I need 10 different Spocks. I could probably get talked into six, but... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> like, the, the problem with that, yeah, is... It's like Playmates in the 90s, but the yeah. difference is those Playmates <laughs> figures in the 90s were five bucks each. Yeah, yeah. So you could afford to buy 10 different Spocks. Right. No one's dropping, well, someone is, but most people aren't dropping two grand on Spock figures. Right. So so that's what I'm that's what I'm struggling with. I want Captain Burnham. Right. But I'm being offered Commander Burnham from season two. What I may be thinking I'm gonna do, because I think these are gonna hold their value fairly well, is probably is probably order the Burnham and then this Burnham and then sell this Burnham when Captain Burnham oh, arrives. Oh, yeah. Because once they sell out, they're gone. Exactly. So, yeah. And what I if mean, this much, is the only Burnham? How much are the, the Picard ones going for on eBay now? Uh, Yeah, pretty, like, I, I, those have not appreciated as m much. I think, like, the, the one to look at is the X06 data figure, the first okay. one they did. Those are up, like, 200 bucks from from when they were purchased. And actually, I, I say I did this sort of with a, the devious intention to sell it. I actually did it because I, I ordered one and then I didn't I didn't notice there was another one you could order. I actually ordered both of the Cisco figures because I didn't realize there were two <laughs> different kinds and I ordered the essentials. And then I was like, oh, actually I want the standard. So then I ordered the standard. And then I was like, okay, now I've got two of them. I guess I could cancel one of them out, but I'm like, no, I'm going to hold on to it and sell it because it will appreciate in value. It's the, you know, just like all those Playmates figures did. This one's going to finally make me all that money back. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you can you can still buy them for the same price that they were in the 90s. So at least they didn't depreciate. Exactly. Exactly. I like where your head's at. So <laughs> the, the one that's really going to be a challenge for me, though, is they're going to do a season two Discovery Pike in the yellow Enterprise yeah, no. uniform. And I want Strange New Worlds. Yeah. OK, well, if he's in the Enterprise, he, is he in the Enterprise uniform or is yes, he in the Discovery he's in the uniform? Enterprise uniform, oh, which, see, which ends up being very uniform really... similar wouldn't want like right. 
And if they're doing that, that makes me think they probably won't do the Strange New Worlds one, at least not for a long time. Well, no, because like this is great thing about Nanjin who runs X06. His his Facebook feed is a complete open book about what they're working on. Right. He said today he started working on Strange New Worlds stuff. Oh, okay. So because he's so excited about the show and you know wants to make some product I for it, I might have to buy every single Strange New Worlds X06 figure. Yeah. So that's the Captain Pike that I want. But do, anyway, I, I, I'm I'm boring the listeners with my existential crisis of whether to spend. <laughs> $200 <laughs> on a discovery pike or not. And yes, I will reiterate, I'm very privileged to be in the position to be able to do that. <laughs> very few other people find themselves with the will or inclination or the money to make those kind of choices. And I'm a very lucky person. So yeah, <laughs> anybody want an X06 figure? I guess I'm giving away. <laughs> and I'm a very lucky person to be your friend so that I can come see your figures on display. Yes. Well, you know, the full collection room we got going on here, it's uh, uh, I'm turning it into an attraction. I've got people coming by uh, like a month from now to take a look at this place. And I'm, I'm like dusting everything and like <laughs> making sure everything's just right because i gotta show this place off in tip-top condition for my guests <laughs> all right well, we've talked about the facts and now let's speculate on what's going to happen in the future of star trek you make some very good points captain but it's still all speculation and theory so each week my guest and i give you a wish or theory we're nurturing about any of the shows or the future of the franchise so thad let's hear your theory or wish for this week okay so this is way out there and there's no actual evidence this is going to happen it's my favorite kind of theory but i think we're gonna get we've had plenty of crossovers of characters from other shows on lower decks yep but i think some point in the next year or two, we are going to get a crossover from Lower Decks to one of the other shows. Interesting. Tell me more. I mean, obviously, Prodigy is the obvious choice because yep. then, you know, it's set possibly in the past, possibly. But there are people in Prodigy from post Lower Decks timeline. The yep. Prodigy's time is a little wibbly wobbly and they're animated. But I'm not discounting the possibility of one of the Lower Decks cast members showing up as their character on the card yep like if tawny newsom shows up as mariner or something mm -hmm. i think it's gonna happen at some point and it's gonna be awesome again i have no evidence that this is actually going to happen it's really just i want this to happen yeah it would be really cool wouldn't it and you know what i <laughs> you know what i would think would be really fun it's just let's just do it hugh frame roger rabbit style right like <laughs> like why not for an episode <laughs> that would be amazing just have some fun with it right like you know so you're saying animated like an animated boimler is like in the crowd or something in a scene on the card that would be amazing yeah right yeah sure or uh or animated mariner goes and visits the discovery right like <laughs> Yeah, that'd be fun. I'm sure that's far too expensive and completely nonsensical. Yes. But, you know, that would be uh, that would be a lot of fun. Yeah, I love that. I love that. I mean, I'd love to see that. I love and, and it'd be fun, right? It'd be fun for them to figure out how to do something like that. Because why not? You know, we're almost at 900 episodes of Star Trek. You want to do something a little avant-garde and a little zany for one episode of the show as a way yeah. of celebrating two of the shows that are on right now and both the animated and the live action heritage of Star Trek? Be my guest, man, right? Like, go ahead. You know, more power to them. I'd love to see that. Yeah, what, what's like had this in my brain has been ever since Mission Chicago when we got to see the cast of Lower Decks and they had, all came out on stage in cosplay. Yeah. And like, they all look a lot like their characters. Yeah, they sure do. So it would not be at all strange to have just one of them play one of their characters in a right. live action context it would work perfectly well i think yeah all right let me give you let me tell you what's going on in my head this week it's not really a wish and it's not really a theory it's more of like a what the hell is going on what the hell is going on with the star trek book publishing line again <laughs> <laughs> we are in the I think we're about two thirds of the way through a nine month gap between Star Trek novels. The last one we got was Star Trek Deep Space Nine Revenant in December. The next one we're guessing is the Star Trek Picard season two tie in, which was originally scheduled to come out the month that season two premiered, but then got pushed to September. We then have or had an original series novel, which I think is still on the books for November, which is a tie in to the popular Star Trek Vanguard series. I we had December. a. Uh, in November or December, it's one or the other. We had a Star Trek Strange New Worlds tie-in book 
which was announced for November and has now already been moved to February of 2023. So the season one tie-in book will now be the season two tie-in book. And we've heard nothing else about other books. We know about the existence of three more books in Star Trek publishing. And we've not gotten any more announcements about books. And really, so with the exception of the Strange New Worlds book and David Mack's original series novel, I think it's been about a year since we learned uh, any new books because we knew the back half schedule for 2021, Coda, all the other novels, The Revenant, all of that came out in early 2021. So it's now been a, we've now had only two new books announced in one year. And that is crazy considering where we started. I don't know if they're back in license renewal, just even though it feels like we just did that like two years ago or what's going on. I mean, obviously, you know, pandemic and supply chain challenges have been a problem. I think that's what's kind of held up the Picard novel and maybe is also responsible for holding up the Strange New Worlds novel as well. But I kind of posed this question on Twitter and David Mack got snippy at me and kind of, you know, attributed it wholly to the supply chain challenges. But I don't believe that because... Supply chain challenges don't account for whole books not having been announced, right? That like delays that absolutely accounts for delays. Exactly. But But it doesn't account for the absence of novels. Right. That's not a supply chain problem. That's a something else problem. Because the other thing, too, is also, you know, when Coda was wrapping up, right? James Swallow, David Mack, Dayton Ward, all three of them said at that point, it, this changed for Matt because then he went, he's written this, you know, original series novel. But all three of them said, we're not doing anything Star Trek right now, right? It's not like all the authors are being like, oh yeah, I've got one or two in the tank, but for whatever reason, right. you know, yes, I have another Star Trek book coming, but no, I can't say anything about it. It doesn't sound like there are any Star Trek books being written right now, right? Like, I mean, maybe there are at this point, but certainly, you know, sort of five, six months ago, there weren't, and that pushes everything back. So like, what the hell is going on with the book publishing line? This is crazy. Please sort it out. Star Trek books are great. When they did Coda, I didn't think that was going to be the end of the Star Trek book publishing line, period, end of story. Yeah, all that was for the rest just of time. supposed to be the end of the post-Nemesis continuity. Exactly. We were supposed to get more books. And the right. fact that we got Revenant and Shadows of Offended last year had me thinking, oh, we're, gonna, we're going back to this. We're just going to have a bunch of books set during the series. Right. Which is great. That's fine. But we're not. Yeah, because we're not getting anything. I especially feel bad for like, I mean, Enterprise book fans. Yeah. When was the last time an Enterprise book came out? Rise of the Federation, yeah. No, 2017. I think it was 17, yeah. Uh Uh-huh. Because it was back under under the old pocketbooks format. Right. And that's, yeah, that's absurd. Yeah. So I don't know what's going on over there, but... It sucked in 2016, 17, when there was a giant gap in between Star Trek novels. It's sucking right now, and it feels like it's going to go on for longer because it's now June, and it feels to me like if there was a January, February, March book coming with the exception of the Strange New Worlds book, which was delayed from Q4 of this year, we would start learning about it. Meanwhile, where's your Star Trek Prodigy printed tie-ins? Where's your Star Trek Lower Decks printed tie-ins of any kind? You know, like, where is any of this stuff? I asked Dayton Ward about Lower Decks tie-ins at Chicago, and he said that there will almost certainly never be any books, but there will probably be comics. But there hasn't been anything announced. Yeah, right. I mean, that's just, that, that, that is all speculation, right? In the sense that it doesn't exist. So, <laughs> yeah, so right now we've got nothing. We've got nothing. And I would like something. So... There we go. I miss the days of one book a month. Yeah. My my wish is I would like to have more than three books to look forward to in the next eight months. That's my wish. Do you have a theory or a wish for Discovery, Picard, Strange New Worlds, Lower Decks, or Prodigy that you'd like to share? Tweet them to me at Weekly Trek or email them to me at Weekly Trek at the Tricorder Transmissions.com and I might feature your theory in a future episode. Well, that's all the time we've got for this episode of Weekly Trek. Thank you so much to my guest, Thad Haight, for joining me today. Thad, how can people contact you if they want to continue the conversation? Best place to find me is on Twitter, where I am at Tyrannicus, which is T-Y-R-A-N-I-C-U-S. Also, you can hear me every week ranting and raving about Star Trek on Infinite Diversity over on the BQN Podcast Network. 
And you can find this show on Twitter at Weekly Trek and me at Alexander T. Perry. And if you enjoy the show, please consider leaving us a five-star review on your podcast player of choice. And please check out some of the other great shows on the Tricorder Transmissions. And if you like our shows, please also consider becoming a Patreon of Tricorder, which you can find at patreon.com slash the Tricorder Transmissions. And lastly, if you're looking for Star Trek news on the internet, I hope you will turn to trekcore.com. Well, thank you, Thad. Thank you to all of my listeners. And until next week, live long and prosper. 